Your mic. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we shall start. Uh, my name is Mauricio Tavares. I work at uh, the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, which I guess uh, from here it's a bit to the right, the west, whatever you want to call it. I. Okay. No, it is west. The planet is round. You can just go around. You just, co uh, just cross a few puddles and come back the other way. But, so, well, I guess uh, we might be talking about uh, using uh, Arduino and KVM on uh, Linux uh, setup. So, let's talk about the uh, Arduino itself. It is, uh, was created in 2005 in Italy, and the reason they started, from what I understand, is the same problem I had. Usually you used to have things like this, big computers, and they were expensive. And usually, you know, they cost like a hundred bucks. If you either you get the board, and then you buy this, and then put the entire environment around it, which adds up, and then you start have to program it in basic, which sucks. Or you do something else, and that's what they end up doing. So one of the other oh, goals they had was on the hardware. Yes, it runs a well, there's a board, but more important about the uh, board design and the schematics, they are open source. And that's different from a lot of the boards you can go uh, online and buy for the old pick boards and stuff like that. Either you build your own or you're going to buy some commercial stuff and you're, de you're dealing with whatever they have. But they made the entire source, the, not only the source code, but the entire diagrams are, be are available online on their website. So you can get it, download it, build your own board. If you don't like theirs, then go to town. Now, on the software side, their ID is they kind of, uh, it's also open source, and you develop the, the way they call the little source, the programs you develop, they call them sketches. And as I said, you know, that, that's what they use for the ID, uh, ID, you know, the GPL. You can also, the ID, just like most of the IDs you have, they are like, uh, you know, you have the little GUI runs on Windows, Mac, uh, Linux and whatever else you want to uh, compile it and make it work. You know the code's available. Do whatever you want. And but that said, you can also if you don't want to use the GUI to compile this stuff, upload things, include the libraries, you can do it command line. You can create make files, compile the uh, the thing, and then send to the uh, device. Now, one thing I like about this compared to also the Pick based is it's C, C, C and stuff like that. So, more same language. Now, yes, uh, according to what I found, that there's more than 100 different Arduino compatible boards out there. And they are big. I've seen ones this big, they are kind of tiny little ones, anywhere in between, you know, because the chip itself. Uh, I can show you the chip, but it's, uh, if you get a surface mount chip, you can build a board that's probably like a centimeter by centimeter if you're really good. So, but Arduino it, uh, itself makes a board. This is your quintessential Arduino board. Let's see where the camera is. Oops. I just pass around it. If somebody wants to smell, don't lick it. But that's, a, that's the quintessential Arduino board. You know, they're made in Italy. Those pins, uh, they have their own standard format, which allows you to get stuff like uh, 
monitors, it is a touch screen by the way, but you see the pins on the back. And then you just pass around. The pins on the back, they are kind of standard. And you can uh, just do, so you, uh, they allow you to do, uh, you know, those, all those modules that would work with every Arduino, unless you make a special Arduino that doesn't have those pins. Now, we also have the Arduino derivatives that are not, uh, they are not made by Arduino, but since it's open so, uh, source, the entire thing, the hardware and the software, some people do it. The first uh, besides event in Orlando, the badge was an Arduino board. I forgot to bring it, otherwise I'd show it. Now, there's also this other board here. Don't mind the name, but uh, they changed the name now to Robo Red. And then uh, you also have Arduino clones that you know are just, uh, they look exactly like an Arduino board down to the collar, but they don't write anything. And you can find them on eBay and Amazon for cheap because Arduino boards are around uh, 25 to 30 bucks. Then other ones, like including that red one, is 15 bucks. So, and you have the counterfeits that, you know, they just like Arduino boards that are not made by Arduino, but they're made to look like it. And yes, you can find them on eBay and Amazon all day. Now, just the Robo Red, the one you're seeing there uh, over the place. The, things I per the thing I personally like on it is if you see this diagram, all those pins that have the analog and the, the digital ports are, I think I probably should describe a bit about what are, what is interesting about the Arduino are those uh, ports, because instead of being like a little computer, it acts as designed to talk to something else. You know, for instance, you can use it to control your AC in your house. You can do it to, uh, control a camera, uh, if you have a cat, have something to feed your cat. Or if you, if you have a roommate that you're not very fond of, you just get a speaker, connect to it, and then you have it at six o'clock in the morning to annoy him, and you hide it somewhere, so. The, but the idea is it can talk out and talk back in. It's not very smart. This is not like, say, a uh, Raspberry Pi. But for what you're trying to, uh, to accomplish, I think it's good enough. So, as I said, I, I personally see the Arduino as, if you, any, any of you use Docker, it's a Docker container. The idea of Docker container is you have, uh, you define one container to do one job, one job right. For instance, if you're going to do a mail server, you can have one Docker container to do send mail, the other one to handle, uh, to run, say, Dovecot, and you have them talk to each other. And that's how you should see Arduino. Don't expect it to do a lot, but if you just focus each of them to do one thing, you'll be very happy. The idea, uh, when also when you change the configuration, you just upload the entire thing. It's not like, say, on the Raspberry Pi that you just change the, you just connect to it, change the config, and off you go. You change the entire code, upload it, and then it restarts itself, and off it goes. And until you change it again, or you turn it off, that's how it knows. So, now let's talk about a little about emulation. You know, we all know about emulation, that you know, the idea is you're just trying to run something uh, on your hardware, you are, you are emulating, as I uh, put here, a computer or just an instance, kind of like the Docker I just mentioned. And some, on a full uh, emulation, you can just emulate from a different CPU to just an entire computer that runs on that same CPU or whatever. Main reasons people like to use that to save, actually should be space, not state, and time and allows you to do some centralized management. So uh, you, can, you can have a bunch of uh, VMs in one machine and then you can have a 
something to manage all those VMs and do, uh, you can move them from one, one VM server to another, and so on. Some people claim it's kind of an environment because kind of like, uh, you know, one time I swapped, replaced uh, eight, an active 12 machines that each of those used 80 watts into one VM host that we use 200 watts. So power utilization wise, you're, you're ahead of the game. Uptime. Once again, the uptime is um, more that you know you can build a robust machine, and a lot of VM solutions allows you to live migrate your VM from one machine to another. And testing. The I like to build VMs just to test something because something happens, I just blow it up. I know people that use that when they're doing a virus research. Receive something infected, you create a VM through it there. Something happens, who cares? You re re resume from the snapshot. And let's be honest, a lot of uh, the cloud solutions are based on VMs. Now, there's a lot of commercial stuff out there. There is a some uh, open source. I don't know where to put VirtualBox because they put some stuff out to open source, but others is not. So I don't know about that. KVM, which I personally use, Docker, which is based on LXC, and those are instead of you running the an entire different CPU, you know, a full emulation, you can just get you are just building it on your current CPU, your current kernel, and you're building a container around it. So, which boils down to how do you, how much do you want to emulate? You want to emulate the entire computer, just enough to run on packed or somewhere in between. But really, don't care. Let's talk about my setup. Uh, I'm running KVM, so we are, uh, the, my VM host is Linux based, Ubuntu, and I don't. I, when I build it, I rarely use the keyboard and mouse because I can SSH into it and, and do things. The only time you should use a keyboard and mouse in a server is something goes bad, horribly wrong, and you need to connect to console. So the clients, they don't need uh, monitors themselves because you can SSH them. You, uh, you, if you need, you can run X Windows. You can uh, remote desktop to them, which usually be like a Windows machine or run VNC or somewhere in between. The, so there are different ways. Also, you can do a, a straight console as far as the VM is concerned, the VM client is concerned, thinks that you are on its console. So when things go bad, you can boot on, on its console and fix it. The client I built, I'm using for Arduino is a Ubuntu desktop 12.04. Uh, I also run on that same VM host. I mean, I'm doing my DNS server, DHCP, I do the log analysis and stuff like that. I've been doing a USB pass-through, which uh, that's the way you need to connect the Arduino. Because if you look on those Arduinos, they have USB ports. The, that USB uh, connection has to go all the way to your VM uh, client. And the way to do that is called the USB pass-through. VM host another machine I have that you know, does Docker and Git and all that exciting stuff. So, why I want to put them together? Because when I first started playing with Arduino, I used to carry, let's say, on this little box, I used to have the my Arduino my USB thing with uh, the Arduino SDK and any card I want to play with it and USB. So if I want to do something, you have to spread all that on the table. And that uh, that's, gets annoying very quickly, in my opinion, because you might not be in a place you want to do it, you might not have time, or you might want to, and usually I want to start something, and later on I want to come back wherever I am and continue with that. So, which is, I really like to develop, I, I like stuff that you know I can remote in and do development, which is why VMs. Now, and really, I want the less crap I carry, the happier I am. 
And yes, you can do the remote development anywhere you want, but please draw a line somewhere. Now, the you can also use the, if you connect your Arduino straight to a VM client, you can, the Arduino has a console, a serial console that you can access it. So in that case, I did. Uh, I was just playing around. I built, I got an Arduino and I bought a serial temperature, a uh, serial probe, a uh, temperature probe that connects to it. And if you run it, you can get, and then you can read the temperature, calculate it, and spit it out on the serial port. And then your VM, uh, not necessarily VM host, but your machine that's connected to it, you can read on off that serial port the, the information that the Arduino is sending. And it'll be just like text with a, uh, with a line feed on the end, that's it. So here is the process to add yes to in to not to enable but to add an Arduino to a VM client using USB pass through. First thing, you know, you go to your VM host, the machine that's running out the VMs, the server, and you run say LS USB to find out, you know, what's your device. So in this case, you know, I'm actually using the that red guy there. You know which one? You know that uh, that red Arduino that you've been passing around, and it identifies itself as a uh, Arduino Uno. No, I have. We'll get here eventually. But so the, the two uh, the two values you want are the those numbers like two three four one zero 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 one, which are the vendor ID and the product ID. With that, you can create a little uh, file, a little XML file that you're going to feed using the Virch uh, attached device. That, uh, okay. This file, uh, you need to tell uh, my, my VM client called desktop, it's running live right now. So I want to tell it that I'm trying to connect a USB device to it. For that to happen, I create that XML file that describes this USB device. And then by using the uh, command virtu uh, attach and feeding that file, you're going to tell the VM client about that device. So let's find out. You see, when you go to the desktop, there it is. Now, with that, you still remember that you know the Arduino uh, connects and acts like it's connected through as a serial device. And which device it is depends on the chipset they're using. If you're using, uh, the near ones are using this AT Mega 116U4, and that's, if, and that's what you should look for on your device directory for the for a that's what you need to look for now if you have more than one arduino connected and you can do that it's going to be acm01 and etc or if you had another something else using that same chipset you just have to see which is the new one now the old arduino that uh, do a do a and some other models they use the ftdi chipset and then they are seen as the us uh, usb zero or USB 1, whatever you want to call it. Now, the way I run the ID is I SSH doing a X, uh, Windows uh, forwarding or tunneling to my, the, my, the, my desktop, the VM client, and then I just start the Arduino. I, inst I install the SDK on, on my personal bin directory, and then I have to select the device, and then we test it. Uh, that's kind of small and crappy, but the here that where you can barely see when you install it, uh, when you select here under tools, you can uh, 
you have to select what's the device you're using. On this example, I was using my Duo Mi Lenovo, the blue one that you was being passed around. And it uh, then uh, the chips, the processor it uses is this one, 80 Mega 328. And as I mentioned, since that one used the, F, the, F, uh, that F, uh, the FTDI serial to USB uh, chips, it would be identified itself as a USB zero. Now, after you do that, you can write some code, which I have it here. This is the code that I wrote to test the, the temperature sensor. And once you, if you're writing using the, this GUI to send it, you click on this thing with the arrow. That would tell it to upload to the Arduino device. Now, the device I'm using is based on the DTH11 that can do a temperature and humidity. The, the way you can write to the console is using the, this uh, command called uh, serial print. And in this case, what I'm doing here, I'm writing humidity, space, temperature in Fahrenheit for this case. And then uh, the, LN, the LN means going to put the line fit. Now, then I wrote the scripting to read that out. And what it does is going to open the zero, uh, that zero device at 9600 baud. And then it's going to read the humid and the temperature from each line that it reads. This thing here, like, you know, the zero line, read line, so it reads the line. This thing here will be like column minus one, which means get rid of the last character, which is the line feed. And then there's something else that's out there that would split the, into two different arguments. And then uh, you can get the humidity as its variable and the temperature as its variable. And that's pretty much it. Now, of course, the rest of the script can do something else with that. You know, if you're monitoring your house, you know, you can have something to warn you if you have this inside the computer or somewhere. But that's a principle. Now, if you're connecting more than one Arduino, as I mentioned before, you, you have to scan the bus and the USB bus, and you see that, you know, they identify themselves slightly different. You remember the one that used the FTDI chipset? It would just identify itself that you know, I'm using this chipset, not that I am an Arduino. But this principle is the same. All you care about is this thing here. And now there is one thing about the AT Mega, which is that sometimes you upload a, a code for it, you do something, and then you upload it again. And it stopped. It doesn't want to uh, accept the new code. So you have either to reset it somehow, or disconnect it, connect it. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. That's not only on this board, but all the boards I found that used that chipset. The FTDI one, I've never had a problem. But that doesn't mean that you know you cannot use either of them. I do like that red board because all those ports. It's much easier for me to make new wires and set things up because you see each, if you remember, each port, each analog and digital port has a its own uh, voltage, its own ground. So you can just put like three pins, three pins, three pins, three pins, and have you know like fifth, uh, f uh, 15 or 16 uh, digital ports and eight or nine analog ports. That's a lot. And they all complete have their own, uh, they can be independent from, as opposed to have to make a, a mass of wires. Now, some of the boards that I know that use the FTDI is the Duo Milanova and older boards, the one called the red board. The AT Mega is the Uno, that's when they switch to using that chipset, RoboRed, which is the one that's passing around. And I, I would like to find a way that I can guarantee that whenever I have this problem, I can now force it to get the new code. I haven't found that yet. But 
I would love to have shown some demos. I was going to bring some demos, but I finished this late. And so, shame on me. You know, I'm, uh, I'm a clot, and I know that. Because uh, that's why I brought all those boards. I was going to be, try to build something here, and so people could remote in and do things. But so some links I have here that you know you can start the Arduino stuff. If you want to see about that red board, that's where it is. Ada Adafruit is a very good place to find Arduino development stuff. And they're very helpful, they're very active, they are doing the community. Seed Studio, uh, they also have a lot of interesting stuff and documentation. The last one is my own stuff. If you want to have a laugh at uh, my expense, go there. So thank you for yourself, because uh, I didn't expect to uh, be here. Ubuntu for trying to do their best to help me out. Arduino because a very interesting device and I really like these little small ones. I'm going to be putting a few in my car. The people who made the red uh, board called your Arduino and because they were very helpful and actually offered them a, in a pretty decent discount those uh, boards that we are giving away and of course my Saab because a very nice car. Any questions? And I probably went too fast. Any questions? I have a question. Yes. Um, you mentioned you're running Ubuntu in a VM. Yes. Uh, is there a reason for doing that opposed to just running it as the host? Well, the you know the the idea about the running the uh, you know let's forget about which uh, OS the, the host is running. You know, yes, I'm running. Uh, Ubuntu, but the reason I like to do the VM is I can do snapshots. As I saw, I can connect to external hardware. You know, doing you can do USB pass through and PCI pass through. So I could even get uh, buy a PCI card, slap on the machine, and tell that uh, that card that can only be used by my VM. And if I'm going to, and this the third thing is. The mach I like to have a machine and just hide it there. I have a, a laptop. My laptop is not very powerful. The only thing that laptop I use it to, is to access those VMs. And right now, my I act that uh, desktop VM is running my RC client and some other stuff. So I can access it whenever I want. And if I need to do an upgrade, I want to be like a uh, brave. I can do a snapshot, back up, back it up to the try something. If it blows up, revert to the snapshot, which is much nicer than oh, I have to install the OS. Okay. And does the Arduino itself have an OS, or does it just run one set of binaries? The Arduino, as far as I know, is just uh, run the binary, just like a pick uh, board. If someone wants to just god awful thing, I can pass around. Anyone wants to see this? Does anyone want to see it? How old is this? I had it since 2000. I use it for like a, probably a few months and then I never used it again. I'm going to pass it around. All right. So, all right. I'm feeling like they're fader. So, a friend of mine wants to automate his front door where he has a building where he has a collaboration environment and um, he was talking about wanting to use Raspberry Pi and since I just got an Arduino is that something that would be a good good thing if, to use for this type of a project and can you do stuff like can you hook up like are there things out there we could put RFID sensors and query data DBs and all sorts of yeah, things like that but I th if, it, if it was me I would use the Arduino to interface to the physical device but maybe the Raspberry Pi, if he wants to do uh, something more like if you're going to do authentication, because you know Raspberry Pi will run in Linux. They, but the Arduino, you know, uh, actually at the hacker space in Gainesville, Florida, they they had badges that you just uh, get close to the door and then unlocks the thing. Yes, and though that is running on Arduino. But you know that that is simple. As I said before, 
Arduino is a, as a container. Don't expect it to do too much, but it, what it can do, it can do really well, which is interface with a hard, uh, external hardware physical thingy. Uh, all right. So I guess right, you're using this uh, to connect via USB, so you still got some kind of tethering going on between Arduino and uh, a machine. Now, have you tried this out with like the Arduino Yung, which has built-in wireless? Uh, you, you can get these modules that do uh, wireless. I don't have one here, but here's one for Ethernet. Right, so that can internet shield on it? Hmm? Oh, it has an internet sh Ethernet shield on it? Uh, yes. Yeah. Right, let me see. <whistles> Better get you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you would plug this into like a router? Yes. Because I guess, you know, if you run a virtual, ideally you might not want to have a computer. Oh, yeah, let me bring it around. Because you see, one uh, one thing you, you could have done, you know, was you install one of those, but then you have to get the connectors to your, for instance, you know, one thing I've seen someone do is get this, get the Arduino and uh, humidity sensor and put in the server room in case you get flooded. And then just warn you, hey, I'm getting flooded or my temperature is going up or something. The thing about that that you see, you know, you, you're going to put that, and then you're going to put the, uh, the other pins for your temperature sensor. And, you know, it, it's not a bad idea, because the Arduino, once you download this stuff, you can turn off, turn back on, it's there. It becomes like, you know, just an appliance. But the thing I wanted to do was more that, you know, I wanted it to be interacting to a computer, which is kind of his example, that, you know, the Arduino gets some information and then let the computer make a decision. Because there's nothing stop the computer can now send back information back to the Arduino and change something there. So, but, you know, it really depends how you're, what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, it, but the way I see is the flexibility, that's what I like on those. So, uh, do you um, primarily use uh, the Arduino, or do you ever uh, just break it down to the Atmega chip itself and uh, work with them directly? I'm not that clever yet. You know, I'm trying to. I think uh, I have a feeling that I forgot what those are. I think those are the. Uh, Graft is a harsh mistress. But you know you can buy uh, the you can buy the AT Mag chip you you can buy a uh, and then you can upload to it. And in fact, they even have little mods that you can connect almost to an Arduino board to program those chips. And one uh, one day, you know, when I when I grow up, I might want to try to do that. Get back in there. But, and I think, you know, that makes com uh, complete sense. But, you know, we start somewhere, and my thing really about the Arduino was just a same programming language instead of have to write a simple language or basic, which I never liked, and I, I make a point never to like it. Then uh, the libraries, the open source support, especially if you want to stay on open source. And you can, you, you can use it mostly to think of it also as a prototyping device. You test your idea, and then if you want, then you can go back to it, because you know, the AT Mag, uh, uh, the AT -mag uh, chipset, there, there is information in it. After you do it, you can build the onboard. I wish I had brought the besides uh, Orlando badge, because that's what uh, John Singer, so I would like to put his name there so he can uh, Feel uh, ashamed that I insulted him in vain, but he he designed his own board, his Arduino board. He got the chip, he designed the own board, laid out, and made the badge. So you know it's completely doable. But I still think those guys are great if you're prototyping something. You know some stuff I want to do in my car. I'm going to use some of those things to try it out to see if uh, what I want to do is possible. But I don't want to have like five of those in my car when the chip's about this big. So I'm going to just make something small, only the wires that I need, because I don't need like a nine digital ports. So I might just need two or four. 
and then I build a, something that's more optimized for my task and do it. But as a general uh, prototyping thing, those guys are very convenient. All right. Any other questions? All right, uh, you've got some stuff to give away for people who ask questions. Yes. Well, we can. Uh, no, let's see. Let's find a good victim. That you. Yes. Yes. You got one. All right. Thank you. All right. Shirt. Shall we give a shirt to another victim? Sure. Give a shirt out. Okay. Let's find a good victim. Yes, what's his size? We have uh, large, extra large, and double X. Large. All right, we got one large. Yes, I think. Uh, no, I think that's extra large. There. Here. Okay. All right, our only large. Everyone else is getting baggy shirts. Now. You should feel special. All right. Good. All right thank you, everyone. All right, we have uh, 15 minutes, I think, and then we will be, we'll be back here for uh, Rick Spencer's talk. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Citrix Zen Server gives you everything you need to integrate, manage, and automate a virtual data center, all on an enterprise-class, cloud-proven virtual platform, and at a third of the cost of other solutions. But why even bother with virtualizing your server infrastructure in the first place? Well, let's say you have a traditional one server to one application architecture, but you're running out of resources and performance is suffering. Once you order new server hardware, you'll wait for delivery, configure it, install your business application, stage and test the server, and finally, add it to your production farm. If you've been through this process before, you know it can take weeks or even months. You also know it's a manually intensive process that will burden your team every time you outgrow your current setup. With a virtual server solution, you could accomplish all of that in less than half a day. Server virtualization software separates the OS and application from the underlying server hardware. And with multiple virtual machines on a single server, you can use each of them to run different OSs and applications. This makes it possible to move your virtual machines from one piece of hardware to another whenever you want, to maximize utilization, simplify maintenance, or recover from a hardware failure, and without slowing down your applications or users. 
Clearly, server virtualization provides big benefits. And Citrix Zen Server provides even more. Since it's built on an open platform, Zen Server plays well with your existing hardware, storage systems, and IT management software, as well as with the industry's leading cloud service providers. Best of all, you can get started by downloading a fully functional, production-ready version of Zen Server for free. After a 10-minute installation process, you'll see how easy it is to start virtualizing your workloads and automating your IT management processes. And when you're ready for a richer set of management tools, just upgrade to one of the premium editions of Zen Server. So whether you're interested in virtualizing servers for the first time, expanding your server virtualization footprint, or moving server workloads to the cloud, download and install Zen Server today and see how it can help you simplify your IT environment. Citrix Zen Server. Do more. Don't spend more. Thank you.